Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it has been an exhilarating uh, growth for electric two-wheelers over the last few years. Um, penetration in the scooter space is already at 15%. The overall two-wheeler market uh, penetration has also seen uh, about a 5% uh, kind of a uh, penetration level and uh, you know this has been very uh, critically led by the fame subsidy so far but as the industry gets ready for a, a lower subsidy regime uh, amid intense effort to uh, reduce cost uh, what really is the way ahead and uh, today we'd, we'd like to you know try and understand from our eminent panelists about you know who really is the consumer of an electric two-wheeler today and uh, what are really the driving factors that is going to determine this growth sustains over a period of time? I'd like to first uh, begin with uh, uh, Mr. Pokela. Um, you know, you've been, uh, uh, you took a bet uh, as a startup, got into this space. Um, you know, what has been uh, your experience uh, in this journey of how has the customer journey evolved in the acceptance of electric two-wheeler space? I think it's been um, an eventful and exciting journey. Uh, the first sign of that is when I started eight years back, I had a lot of black hair, it's all gray now. So it's a tough business. But uh, on a serious note, I think what we've seen is the, um, is the evolution uh, in, in the consumer side of the dynamics, right? I'm not talking about the supply side, manufacturing cost as different as on the consumer side. Five years back when we started, uh, you would normally expect a new category and a new player to start on a, on a clean slate. Uh, but in our case, um, because at that point in time, the market essentially was China imports. So either there was low awareness of the category itself, or the awareness was built on the back of what people saw as what they thought was the defining products for electric uh, scooters. And that picture wasn't really great, right? So they weren't best quality products, you know, not great uh, quality, reliability, uh, build quality, uh, and a variety of things, right? So people just assume that you went electric if you want to save money, or in some cases, a very small minority if you want to save the world, but you just sign up for a compromise. So that was the starting position. So the first two, three years, essentially for us, was uh, doing a lot of category building stuff. We're trying to dispel the myth that electric, let alone not be a compromise, it is the future of the automotive. And it is in recognition of that dynamic that even the first product that we had, the Ether 450, we said, you know, if you have to dispel the myth that electric is a compromise, let's build the best scooter that, that we, that's out there, not just the best electric scooter, and have people judge us on, on parameters on which they judge traditional scooters credibility, top speed, acceleration, build quality, reliability, all those things. Once you cross that, cross that bridge, then you start talking about disconnected, touchscreen, a variety of things, right? But the critical thing was that, you know, judge, hold me by high standards, judge me as you would a traditional scooter, and if I pass that, then cut me slack for electric if you have to. So a lot of category building stuff. But what, and also at that point in time, you know, because the, uh, because of the very nature of where the category was, there was a, a loads of early adopters where, honestly, they would have bought any great product at that point in time. Forget reliability, because that's the nature of early adopters. But what's happened now is that in the last, last few years, the market is transitioning to sort of a little more majority type of a, a, a consumer scenario. And now what we see today are people who are walking in, Sure, there's awareness of electric. People don't need to be sold on the goodness of electric per se. It's more about this brand suits my needs better than the other brand, and it's more classic brand differentiation stage. Uh, but the consumer is no longer an early adopter, techie kind of a guy. He or she would be somebody, if they hadn't bought this, they would have bought a good 125cc scooter. So the, it's the beginning of the mainstreaming of the category, which is, which is why you see the volumes going up. People are not just buying on the back of TCO, et cetera, the bank, because they just believe it is just a better technology, addresses the need of a scooter, and then it has a plus-plus of connectivity and touchscreen and a variety of other things, right? Right. Uh, Mr. Harney, uh, I'd like to get your views about uh, how different are the consumers from an R&D standpoint. You've spent all your years developing products, understanding consumers. How different are these buyers? What are the different criteria that a consumer of an electric two-wheeler uh, has in mind vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some of the ICE buyers that you may have? 
basically a two wheeler customer is first two wheeler customer so the standard requirements like what just now we heard the acceleration gradability basic performance these are uh, of course required but the electric came with certain background because of uh, past many products were there which are uh, low power so like uh, 250 watts to 1 kilowatt or in that range and then every customer first has got that fear that whether the vehicle will be able to climb by gradient in a flyover or something like that. So this is one specific requirement which we had to make sure that there is no way a customer will complain or feel bad about uh, certain performance which is he has always taken for granted in a vehicle. Then comes the range. The all IC engine vehicles have got really manifold range and so here Again, if you have a, if you look at the actual data and which we found out uh, quite openly it is available, that around 25 to 30 kilometers is the average riding per day. And so we thought that if we give a three, three days useful range, I'm not talking about the claims what anybody may make, but I'm talking about the real, real life range, three days, then it requires 80 to 100 kilometer range so that a customer has got time to charge. And then the third is what time it takes to charge. Is it two hours? Yes, a lot of people will be very happy if it is two hours. But uh, certainly three, four, five hours, if it is once in three days or once in a week, the customers will be okay to charge like that. So these are the things we observe. In addition, there is a lot more uh, scope for doing something new because more and more electronics has come in. There are more controllers. There are more control systems with... Uh, uh, data acquisition and analytics and then doing something to improve the say regeneration, improve the braking, improve safety, do the thermal management. So removing all the fears from the customer's mind about those issues which they have heard or which were there in the past on the electric vehicles was another thing which we can call it as a safety related anxiety or range related anxiety or performance issues. So this was the first thing we worked on and sorted out all this. Uh, Mr. Vaz, uh, uh, you know, you've again, just like TVS Motor, uh, understand both the ICE and the EV market. According to your understanding so far, what have been the key drivers for uh, an Indian buyer to look at an electric two-wheeler? And are those driving factors going to remain in the future? And how can one sustain this momentum that industry had over the last few years, uh, how can the category be built over a period of time? Uh, thank you, Ketan. Uh, <clears throat> I think if we look at uh, what has driven uh, people to adopt electric two-wheelers, uh, there are two prime reasons. I think first is the perceived low cost of operation. It's a very powerful driver for the Indian consumer. Uh, we always ask, na, kitni mileage deti hai? This is a common term. For those who don't understand Hindi, how much mileage does it give? Anyone who's bought a two-wheeler in this country asks the mileage question in the showroom. So when he hears that he, his cost per mile comes down dramatically with electricity, there's a great incentive to buy. And of course, the government subsidies have helped a great deal. The second big driver is, I think, quality. Uh, and this you can see in data. If we go back to the data of, say, 2021, we're now in 2023, almost the full year, you would see that the top five or six players, when I say top, I don't mean by volume, I mean by quality. Some of the people sitting on this podium, for example, would be in the top six players. They were only around 25% of the total industry. Today, the same top six players represent 80% of the industry. The flight to quality and the recognition of customers that you've got a bunch of high quality products has led to a growth in the industry. I think these are the two prime factors for adoption. Going forward, what will sustain this? Well, I think the biggest challenge is going to be cost because we must recognize today government subsidies account for almost 100%. You know, 50% of the cost of the product is subsidized by the government. 
lower GST, PLI benefits, fame benefits, and in some jurisdictions, a reduction in registration and road tax. Uh, how much of this is sustainable in the future? I don't know, but it's, it's a good assumption that this is going to come down. And therefore, for I think us as an industry to maintain momentum, uh, how to bring costs down, how to make ourselves more competitive, because the definition against which we will be gauged by the consumer is the ICE product and its cost, because that's an established cost structure in the market. Right. Mr. Well, you've been in the consumer industry for long and you understand them well, and there are various price points uh, within the market. Uh, you know, Aether and Bajaj, they operate in above one lakh rupees category, but there's a big uh, opportunity in the sub one lakh space, but cost, like Mr. Waz mentioned, is still a challenge. Uh, you know, what exactly is the sweet spot for electric two wheelers to take off, according to you? And uh, at what a percentage price difference that a consumer is willing to shift to an EV vis-a-vis uh, -vis an ICE. Yeah, so I think uh, to start with, the Indian demographic structure itself lends it, and the current levels of penetration of motorized option to commute, itself lends for a very high addressable market and a headspace. <clears throat> and that, if you really look at it, the first motorized option becomes a moped or a Luna or then a let's say slow speed electric scooter today, it's about 70,000 or a Hero Splendor mobile would be around 80,000 on road and, and so on and so forth. So sub one lakh is a very attractive price point to start with <clears throat> because even if it is a finance vehicle, it becomes a less than 5,000 rupee EMI option. And if it's a fully paid vehicle, it's a, it's a mental barrier of not crossing a one lakh. And that's why you see about 70 to 80% of market is still under, under one lakh rupees there. Now, Let's look at the overall market and segment it by, let's say, broad three or four segments there. There is a utility customer, which is probably doing about 15, 20 kilometers every day on a two-wheeler, and uh, finds this to be a very attractive, as Eric was saying, very, very attractive option of rupees per kilometer, whether it's petrol or electric. Both ways, it works brilliantly for them. So that's about 10 to 15% of market today <clears throat> uh, of the existing uh, two-wheelers there, and that immediately is ripe for electric to grab. I think the f out of the first 5% that we've had, probably 70, 80% is really that, already there. Yeah. So that's the first segment. And then there is this whole gig worker or B2B on cargo workers, which are purely livelihood driven, as long as the range is good and as long as the downtime is nil almost, which obviously with maturing of technologies, most of these top brands are able to give. That's another 5, 7, 8, 10% of the market that is there to be had. So with 5% penetration today, there is still a headspace of three to four times, even with very, very early adopters of this segment there. And then comes this big family segment, 40 to 50% of India, which is looking at daily rands and uh, multiple people use the same scooter and you use it for your children to be dropped at school or your daughter takes it for a college. I think that's another very big segment there, yeah, which is there. So all these segments are largely highly price conscious, value conscious may not be looking at the high-end data add-ons or bells or whistles at this point of time. They just need, as I think Ravneet also said, and the performance if has to be great. And then comes the add-ons, which is software on wheels or customize my scooter or I want my screen on my scooter, I think is, the, is a premium that people will pay only when the, uh, the belly of the market will get addressed. So my sense is I think we have enough headspace with sub one lakh for all the players here and all the OEMs to really look at. And then of course, there is going to be a segment which is a segment which is image driver, which is you know connected segment of customers, which is tech geeks, which will be the top 15, 20% of the market. And there is enough and more, I think, options that will come there as we go forward. So we've seen uh, ups and downs in the market growth as well as penetration and fame, fame subsidy has played a very critical role there. Uh, let's talk about from the correction in the last few months, how have you seen uh, the adoption either slowing or uh, the hesitation increasing? And when do you really start seeing, probably once the festive season's over, you may have a different, uh, uh, probably monthly TIV, but you know, how has the initial reaction to uh, fame correction has been? And uh, in this new lower subsidy regime, you know, how can you build this further? Yeah, no, I think uh, Eric uh, did mention this point, I think very, <clears throat> adeptly by saying that 
is this sustainable and the amount of this is you know going on and clearly you look at it it's about 5 million scooter market a year in india i'm not even counting the motorcycles which is probably some time away and the price difference for a spec to spec at a belly of the market you do is 30 to 40000 rupees so if you to really offer a entry competitive price for 5 million scooters you're looking at 20000 crores of subsidy yeah That's which massive. obviously is becomes a very very massive amount and is it really sustainable and why should there be uh, to that extent i think that level of kind of uh, grat is given so obviously uh, and why is that so high is because the ic two wheeler market is india is the largest beyond china is the largest market in the world it's the number one auto component in the world and auto sector is all about scale and the dramatic amount of efficiency and capital amortization which has happened on that kind of ecosystem is able to drive the costs to virtually the lowest in the world today and hence when a new technology comes it is at a delta and this question you asked even in the first part of it what is the delta and how much can be bridged the current delta is anywhere between 30 to 40% yeah versus the entry level now when you look at tco total cost of ownership it's very very hard sell for an oem to then say that you know you pay 30000 rupees more in a price conscious market or highly price in entry stick a price market and then over the next 2 years if your mileage every day is going to be 30 kilometers a day then after 2 years you will break even and actually the rest part of the cycle you will gain money and that's a tco concept it comes very difficult to explain the other thing which is yet to establish in ev which will is dramatically denting the tco concept is the resale value is not yet established because it's still a very very early industry so for for ic it's very very clear if you buy a vehicle at 80000 probably in 3 years or 5 years down the line you will easily sell at 25000 here there is absolutely no understanding of battery whether we can there is no circular economy to that matter so my sense is that there is a role that as incentive has to play but only up to a time there is currently the penetration is 5% in two wheelers there look at any industry look at telecom look at e-commerce look at any software industry uh, technology industries the ecosystem of the complexity of the auto industry will need at least one in 6 to one in 5 kind of a vehicles converting with india kind of scale so i i'm i'm basically directing towards a 15 to 20% penetration the moment it reaches up to that level you will need some demand incentive post the which are the next 10 15% can be supply incentive and once it is one in four vehicles i think then the scale itself becomes it enough to get to s curve and exponential kind of a scale so i i see the role of incentives for the next 24 to 36 months in this industry the first part being 70 demand 30 supply then the next part being 70 supply 30 demand and then maybe phasing it out over the next 3 to 4 years that's how i see it right uh, uh, mr fakela in your segment the premium end uh, uh, again the support is critical because at the end of the day they are well off uh, but at the same time they seek value so how long do you think subsidy is needed um, and uh, when do you think we'll hit hit a point wherein an ice buyer will be willing to make that switch so <clears throat> before i answer the specific subsidy i just want to talk about uh, how we frame the category premium right so when the reference point was ice and other average um, ev selling at about 18 90000 1 lakh or so then anybody selling at 1 lakh 35 1 lakh 40 50 was premium correct now if you look at the top four players by volume they account for about 76 77% give or take month on month and that price band is is between broadly 1 1 lakh 20 to 1 lakh 60 or so now if 80% of products are sold there it's not premium it is the market as of now right sure uh, technically price wise it is at the higher end but today that defines what today is the belly of the market right and and then there is one fundamental truth that's defining uh, and that comes from also from you know both sanjay and i come from a telecom business it is in many ways a transition from a feature to a smartphone right so you don't judge it you don't judge a smartphone prices based on feature phone as a reference because it is you you assume you're moving up right now <clears throat> so that's the sort of overall from a how the market is framed perspective from a from a subsidy perspective and, and support perspective I agree with the sanjay i think it's about a 36 or month is exercise even at that price point right 
because what's going, three or three or four things are happening in parallel, right? One is that on the on the cost side, there is there is value engineering that's happening all the time. So a big upside of cost today is just you know cutting the flab out of your architecture and platform. Biggest upside is in design itself, right? Then there is the localization scale thing that kicks in. That's the second thing. The third thing is you know the the organic sort of uh, reduction of cell prices globally, including when, as and when they start local production. That's on the cost side, things becoming slightly better. And on the on the price side, the price table going up gradually, right? So, um, and we believe in about, in about 36 month period where this sort of equation sort of pans out, right? Even now, if you've seen here, when the subsidy was, was cut down recently, uh, you know, the market saw a blip about three, four months, we're sort of clawing away back now. But the important thing is that uh, whether the subsidy stays 36 months, 48 months, or one year, or whatever, I think what's really critical for the industry is just predictability. Like, how do I plan my capacities? What do I talk to my supply chain, my suppliers? How do I look at my manufacturing? What product segments am I going after? That depends entirely on what my understanding of the of the of the subsidy is. Right now, ideally, we are looking at about 36 months or so. Um, you know, which is an ideal a sweet spot, 36, 30, whatever it might be. But let's say there is a situation where there is less affordability. We are much rather we are told today to say, hey, it's going to last six months. Fine, we'll work around it. Right. Like even now, uh, when the subsidies came down, the fact the subsidies came down wasn't a surprise because we were assuming they would last maybe three, four quarters more, right? So I think no, nobody was, uh, nobody factors subsidy forever, right? right. It's just that it came as a shock. We weren't prepared for it. So the, the, the quantum coming down itself was actually not a bad thing at all because it pushed us closer to market reality. So to that extent, there's a silver lining. It's just that when there is less predictability, it just throws the plans sort of off gear, and that's a bigger problem than the actual quantum coming down or not, right? right. Uh, Mr. Vaz, do you agree? Uh, 36 months is a good time frame for subsidy to continue, or in your opinion, you know, how long can the subsidy go on? And, uh, you know, Bajaj Auto has already spoken about working on multiple uh, offerings uh, about affordable versions, a different kind of chetaks uh, in the future. So your view on uh, how long can the subsidy be continued and uh, what is the alternative beyond subsidy? So, <clears throat> you know, um, I think subsidies are a very slippery slope. As a brander of vehicles and as someone who creates vehicles for consumers, I would love someone to subsidize my prices. The consumer loves it too. He gets stuff cheaper than he would get otherwise. But I think it's extremely dangerous for the industry for a couple of reasons. First is it's distorted the demand patterns. The way the subsidy is currently structured, it's around the size of the battery. You know, I'm talking about the fame subsidy. Yeah. Yeah, which we pass on to consumers in a transparent manner. So it has forced selection of a certain kind and it has forced development of a particular kind. Is this good? Is this bad? I think time will tell. My own view is it has forced too much development of a particular kind, but there's no way of proving it right now. The second point is there is an unsubsidized segment that sits which is also growing very quietly, which doesn't get recorded, which are low-speed vehicles. Right. The question we have to ask is, why does this segment exist at all if it doesn't get subsidies? And the fact it exists, I think, points to the fact that there are other applications out there which mainstream manufacturers, because of the subsidy regime, are not looking at. Right. Uh, there was a hint of that uh, on prices which was mentioned earlier. So I, I am not a fan of subsidies in the way it's currently structured. If you ask me, as Bajaj Auto, I would say, the earlier they're removed, the better. Let, uh, let water find its level. Let us work hard as, uh, to do what we're supposed to do, which is compete. And, but certain kind of subsidies which are non-distortive. For example, you give a GST holiday for some time. GST is an ad valorem subsidy. It is not going to distort. Of course, it distorts versus ICE. Right. But it won't distort among EVs. So I, I think there could be a more intelligent framework on subsidy, which maybe the government is looking at. I have no idea what they're looking at. Uh, I, I think the current subsidy framework certainly needs a revamp, is my view. The sooner, the better. And what should the, the I mean, what would be your recommendation for the... Uh... No, I, I'm the <laughs> one to recommend. 
that SIAM will require. <laughs> right. And uh, the other end of the market, which is the last mile and uh, the gig worker economy, and you've, uh, you, you have your alliance with Yulu, you've invested in them. Uh, they've started springing up at uh, significant uh, uh, you know, number of places uh, in major metropolitan cities. How has the experience been? Do you think that's a low-hanging fruit? And uh, probably you start there, build scale, and it starts affecting, or uh, you know, that's a different end of the market altogether? So we are... Uh, our relationship with Yulu is one as an investor, which I won't, won't speak about today. The second is as a supplier of vehicles and the batteries to them. Uh, and I think it's been very interesting because, again, this is a non-subsidized end of the business. It's low speed. Uh, and uh, the proof of the pudding is in the utilization of the assets which are put out, <coughs> which are fairly high. So I, that's why my comment that, you know, there is a segment that operates without subsidies and we need to understand why it manages without subsidies when the other segment needs so many subsidies. So, uh, so I think Yulu's been a very good example uh, of what can be done. And uh, it can only happen because it's an electric vehicle. You cannot execute a Yulu model with an ICE vehicle. Right. You know, petrol will be stolen. You unfortunately cannot steal charge from a battery. Right. Yeah, so so it's, an, it's a very interesting play and I think this is exactly the kind of stuff that led to the great mobile telephony growth, which really happened with the smartphone. Right. What the smartphone did was you could do stuff on a smartphone that you simply couldn't do right. with regular mobile phones or with landline phones. Right. So the scope for innovations. Yeah, the scope innovation. for innovation, the scope of opening up white spaces. Right. Uh, Mr. Hardy, uh, could you share some insight here? Could you share some insight here about how do you build a, uh, uh, you know, how do you attract uh, today's youth and how do you build, uh, you know, more attraction towards an EV? And like uh, Mr. Vaz mentioned that, you know, with uh, probably, and even you mentioned about, you know, you know, rising role of electronics and connectivity features kind of allows you to do a lot more. So how can, how can you attract consumers? I mean, it's the product innovation story or is this really a cost story? Yeah, it is about product innovation. It makes a big difference if uh, everybody is used to now mobile phones, everybody is used to the connected technology. And uh, now that electric vehicles have got uh, opportunity to utilize the uh, software, the software uh, applications into achieving better performance, better connectivity, uh, also better optimization during the design and manufacturing and also during actually the use, ease of use. So there are so many things which are coming from the software, coming from electronics, coming from the connected technology, which are opening up a new, completely new window of uh, applications which will be helpful to the customer on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is what I think is the uh, next generation of uh, electric vehicle users with uh, software coming into that in a much stronger way will be uh, finding it very beneficial. Some of the things which are coming from the connected cluster or connectivity are useful to IC engine customers also. But uh, the benefit to an EV customer, because inherently the battery, the motor and the electronics are well connected, even more than what the IC engine to its fuel is connected. So the benefits to benefits of software and connectivity is much higher in IC engine, EV compared to IC engine. And that is where we need to focus on for youth. Uh, you, you do your uh, understanding of consumers uh, from a product development standpoint. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, uh, the incidence of fire and safety had kind of put a sort of a, you know, a, a fear in the mind of some of the buyers. Uh, over the last several months, we've not seen any. Uh, how critical is the safety element uh, uh, in an electric two-wheeler, given the fact that you know you're running on battery? And 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 is that a when you develop a product and when when you listen to your consumers, um, you know, is that one of the uh, you know concern areas or or, or 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 something that they're worried about? Yeah, this is it. It became a very serious issue six months ago, and then finally the new rules came and new control started. But it has been a problem uh, whenever there are lithium-ion, particular kind of lithium-ion batteries are used. Uh, and uh, if there is no control on charging stations, no control on the way the customer is charging or the charging voltage fluctuations or 
power cut off in between and causing trouble or simply just the temperature of the battery pack so it is a it is a multifaceted uh, uh, control which is required but it is possible to make lithium ion batteries work which we have seen in last 6 months last 6 months all the companies have followed good uh, norms of uh, manufacturing of the battery pack cell selection packaging within the vehicle thermal management which we heard uh, some time ago and uh, the whole electronics with sensors and online continuous uh, correction of the things so the controls on vehicle performance beyond some limit it will not allow certain current beyond some speed it will not allow certain kind of uh, degeneration regenerative ability is used only when the battery has got that much capacity and then home charging of course so this has helped quite a lot and uh, with that we have much better confidence and of course we can see the results so the new norms have really helped and uh, that is going to give con consumers the confidence uh, with regards to buying an ev in the future yeah. new norms and the controls yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Bell, uh, you know, you cater uh, to uh, end of the market, which is, you know, with a predominant share around uh, about 100,000 and 70, 80,000 uh, rupees. And, uh, you know, uh, Aether and, um, you know, Chetak, they cater to the higher end of the market. Uh, what's your assessment? What exactly is going to be the belly of the market and where the first time buyers will actually start looking for an EV? Uh, you know, where do you see the mass adoption taking place uh, in the coming few years and how much more breathing space do we have on the cost front uh, given the fact that you know if we have a runway of 36 months provided government extends the subsidy regime you know how much more room do we have on cost and I mean is it achievable to bring it closer to the ice price points? No, it is surely achievable. Let me first address the first part of your question. <laughs> Look if the Overall market penetration is about 15 to 20 percent at best of vehicle, vehicular penetration. <clears throat> then the sweet spot is always going to be the edge of it. My view is that a lot of Indians, their first vehicle will become electric scooter instead of, you know, a nice scooter. This is exactly what happened in telecom where the penetrations were under 10 percent, landline was what, 5 percent and wireless telephony took it to 100 percent. In a, over a decade, two decades, we can always keep saying the jury is out, whether how much time will it take, but eventually it will be um, a, a kind of a combi fuel future, most of it cleaner fuel, uh, cleaner energy. And in that cleaner energy fuel, electric will have a pivotal kind of a share. Uh, and market India itself will grow beyond 20%. So it's not within that share, it will be more motorized vehicle as well. So costs will come down. Now, if you take the battery costs, in a decade, they've come down by 70-80%. Currently, you're talking about cells already under $100 per kilowatt hour. Five years back, they were 150, 180, so 80% down. And if uh, one has to see the forecast in the next two to three years, because battery itself is about 40 to 50% of a vehicle cost. And if you add all electronics, it's 70, 65 to 70% of RMC, if you're, if you're looking at the belly of the market. And if that 65, 70 can be brought down by 30, 40 percent over the next three years, four years, which can happen by maturing technologies and increasing scale, yeah, just by that, no subsidy required for that. Yeah? So 25, 30 percent, you're looking at about half the gap versus IC can get bridged actually within the next 24, 36 months itself. And that's what I was saying that after that, probably we don't need any kind of additional support from demand point of view. So that is the, uh, the sweet spot will be the belly of the market. It is the emerging India, uh, which is currently at about probably 250 to 300 million people, uh, of which probably half of them have uh, a two-wheeler and half of them don't. So that's going to be a, and the sweet spot pricing will continue to be sub one lakh. And I agree with uh, Eric again on the, there are enough and yet to be discovered use cases for the first motorized vehicle. Yulu is a great example yeah, of that. And I think it's kind of created a market out of absolutely, and IC could not do that. So there are pro-electric two-wheeler use cases yet to be discovered. And that itself could be a 50 to 100 million kind of a opportunity sitting in front of all the OEMs there. And that is, that is not part of the addressability that we, the way we see it. So it needs innovation, it needs you know, obviously cost efficiencies which will built in with, uh, with, with scale going forward. 
So on that note, uh, uh, really the prospects are significant for the future. Subsidy needs to continue for this segment to take off. And uh, the future is bright for uh, electric vehicle space. Thank you very much for listening in.